Alright, what is going on ladies and gentlemen? It has been a hot minute since I have allowed you to hear the glory of my voice. And I have a very good reason for that. But before we get into the very good reason for that, because it ties into what I want to speak on, let's talk about something I don't want to speak on. Confidence! And how it impacts you in your daily life. And the reason why I'm here to talk about confidence today is because I took a math test. A very important math test. And you know how, you know, when you take a test, there's a variety of feelings you may experience whilst taking it. Or after taking it, for instance. And some of them have to do with confidence. And so then, you know, sometimes you have that kind of confidence where you're like, fuck yeah, nailed it, knew exactly what I was doing. Knew uh, every single problem. I got a guaranteed 500% on this test right now. And then you have the level of confidence that's a little bit lower and a little bit uncertain. Where you're like, I think I nailed this. I think I knew what I was doing. But it's possible I didn't. So, for all I know, I could have just gotten like a 95, or I could have gotten a 4. I don't know which. It's frightening. And I wanted to share my fear with the world. Because it's so scary. But anyway, we're not here to talk about math. We're not here to talk about confidence. We're here to talk about guilty gear, and we're here to talk about blaze blue. Both of which, stuff has happened. Guilty Gear is more on a personal angle for me. Blaze Blue is, you know, Central Fiction dropped. Uh, I've been meaning to talk about it for a while. It's been out for almost two weeks now in Japanese arcades, so there's plenty of footage to look at, plenty of things to analyze and discuss and whatnot. But first, we're going to talk about Guilty Gear and why it has been a hot minute since you have heard me speak. Because I had other shit to do. <laughs> uh, like, you know, so I did that Guilty Gear video with Chip where I discovered... I'm a dumbass. Not exactly a new discovery, but it was a reinforcement of previously acknowledged information. I'm stupid. I get it. Shit. And for some reason, I record it for the world to see. I don't know why, but fuck it. So, um, after that, I want to get back into Guilty Gear. I do want to start trying to play him. Now, there's three, like, really main things that I, I believe that I probably have to learn in order to be able to properly utilize Chip. That is, uh... Like, the wide variety of usages of his wall cling, which is basically... I mean, that wall cling is, like, vital to his corner game, period. Like, every aspect of his corner game basically hinges on being able to properly utilize wall cling. From his mix-up, uh, his neutral, like, you can use it on defense, you can use it to escape the corner. There's so many things, his combos, every single aspect of his game is reliant... Of his corner game is reliant on the wall cling. Um... And then you have his FDC canceling, his faultless defense canceling, which is basically, as far as I understand it, it's a plinking motion. You do, you plink uh, his kick attack into any other button, and for what, and then that's supposed to give you faultless defense. And then for whatever reason, it just completely halts any air momentum he currently has. So that's what gives him his vortex. That's what gives him his mix up. Um, that's very important to his game. And then jump install stuff, whatever. I think like I think the game actually calls it dragon install, but I don't think it's specifically like chip is because chip doesn't have anything related to dragon stuff. So like I don't think it's actually meant uh, for chip right there. But either way, that's fairly irrelevant. Why are you showing me? Why is a pop up from iTunes occurring in? That's not okay. That's weird. Anyway, um. I need to learn how to do that because that's basically where he'll be getting his max damage from. And so I have I know these things that I need to learn and I need to sit down and learn them in order to probably play chips so then I can start playing Guilty Gear so I can start playing online so I can start recording footage and all of this stuff, but I haven't done any of it. <laughs> because all at once, like I figured that out and then all at once, everything else happened. Fallout 4 came out, which I haven't exactly gotten deep, like that could have... For many people, it has consumed many, many hours. Many less for me. I haven't really gotten into it that deeply. Um, <laughs> let me just... Did I... I think... I don't think I've talked... So, basically, the experience... Uh, the experiences that made me kind of, like, step away and be like, You know what? I'm going to play something else. 
The very first thing was, um, I got sent to this place to, at the time, I thought it was, like, required story-based missions. I now know that it's, uh, if you help out the Minutemen, they will just give you, like, infinite amounts of quests that you just go out and you do stuff, whether it's helping out a settlement or going and taking down, you know, like, some newly moved-in enemies in, in a specific area in the game, which is fucking hilarious to me, because, like, you get sent out to a settlement to talk to them, and they're like, oh, yes, there's the, there's these raiders that have been threatening us. They're holed up here. You need to go take care of them. And they're never holed up anywhere nearby. They're, like, three-quarters of the way across the map, and, like, motherfucker, there are, like, eight other settlements that they should be stopping at prior to getting to you. Why the hell are they attacking you from there? That is terrible management. <laughs> they need to, like, shape up and attack places closer to home. Good golly. But anyway, so I got sent out to one of those, and it was my first experience with... I was level uh, 6 at the time, so level, uh, either 6 or 7. And uh, I was. it was my first experience running into super mutants and their dogs. And so, the very first time I walk up, I turn a corner, I eat a fat man to the face. That is just, that's the first thing that happened. I didn't even know any enemies were there. All of a sudden I heard, Oh, human! Little bit of beeping. Boom. That's it. I'm dead. Okay, cool. Reload autosave. We walk back up. We're more careful this time. We turn the corner. We see that dude. We shoot him. We do basically no damage. Okay, that's fine. He's pretty far away. Probably impacting things a lot. But I notice over to the other side, I have a dog rushing at me, and I have one of those suicide bombing uh, super mutants coming at me, along with one other, you know, just regular, like, melee, wielding a big fat hammer dude coming at me. So I back off a bit. I try to take on the dog. This is my first time entering VATS mode against these dudes. They're level 22. Like I said, I'm level 6. That's a bit out of my league, but I think, alright, with careful, intelligent play... I can handle my business. So this dog's coming at me. Obviously, he's not going to be shooting me. That's not how dogs work. So let me switch to my shotgun and blast this fool's face off. Can't handle Nate. Know what I'm saying? I got a shotgun. You're going to die. So I shoot him four times, point blank, in the mouth. Takes about 20% damage. One shots me. Well, alrighty then. Let me try this one more time. This time I'm going to use grenades, I'm going to use explosives, I am going to use the territory to my, the terrain to my advantage, and I will make this work, because this is a vital mission that I must finish for the Minutemen, because they need me. They didn't, they couldn't care less about that shit. I could fail it and they wouldn't care. But at the time, I was under the impression that it was necessary, that this was going to provide the uh, continuance of my story. So I needed to do this. So I go back, I take cover behind some cars. You may think, why the fuck is this asshole taking cover behind cars against things that he has acknowledged have explosives? Shut up, you're smarter than me. Just hang on a second, wait for the end of the story. So I take some shots, I manage to kill the dog. I manage to kill the melee dude. But then their gosh darn diggity danged suicide bomber doesn't blow me up. He blows my dog up, which is just fucked up. But that explosion manages to light the car that I am sitting behind on fire, and I cannot get away fast enough before that bitch explodes and kills me. So, just think about this for a second. That super mutant was the most diabolical piece of shit in the history of the world. He knew he was going out. He knew this was the end for him. So he made sure I suffered the worst end possible. I had to watch my dog eat a nuke straight to the dome. Shortly before I get exploded into pieces and die. Are you kidding me? So that happened. So then finally I was like, all right, you know, let me not do this. I got a hint to go to this loca some lo random location. Uh, off in the middle of nowhere. So I go there. And then I get a quest that's like, hey, go explore this place. So I'm like, okay, cool. I'm going to go explore this place. At this point in time, I'm no longer level 6. I'm now level 17. I'm a strong motherfucker. Strong, strapping young man just starting to take over the wasteland. I'm going to make this world my own. Know what I'm saying? Can't nothing stand up to Nate. So we go in there. 
we explore. There's some roaring. It's like a kind of common horror-based game kind of going on right now. So we travel. We go through. We handle our business. Nothing's attacked us yet. We, there's just a bunch of dead bodies around. There's some roaring, some scuffling, some smashing. But it's all good. It's all sound effects. You can't scare Nate. He's the future king of the wasteland, motherfucker. You can't intimidate me. So I walk up. I turn a corner. Oh. Hi there, Mr. Deathclaw. How you doing? Alright. Let me shoot this dude in the face. It does approximately a single pixel of damage. And he one-shots me. Oh, well, we're going through this again. All right, well, fuck it. This time, I'm going to get a sneak attack on him with this missile launcher that I was just handed. I'm going to do some damage. You know I'm going to do some damage. So I sneak. And I hit him with a sneak and attack missile. Straight to the dome. It might have done 5% damage. With a sneak attack added to it. And he turns around and one-shots me. Now, here's the thing. When I did that sneak attack, I was in vats, and I was able to notice what level that this thing was in comparison to myself. Would you like to guess? It was level 61. This game sent me on a side mission to fight a dude that is 50, like 50 levels higher than me. How is that nice? That's shit! You're an asshole, Bethesda. And so at that point, it's like, you know what? I'm taking a break. I'm just going to walk away for a bit, and we'll come back later. Maybe. Possibly. I'm kind of bethesda out, to be perfectly honest, because I played the living hell out of Morrowind, and ever since, um, basically, Fallout 3, I haven't really ever been able to get into a Bethesda game to the same level uh, that I ever got into the previous ones. And, like, with Fallout 3, I think it might have actually been just the suffering, the end of... So, basically... In Fallout 3, I had a very bad experience because I did so... I had a huge, like, maybe... Not a huge, but maybe, like, 30, 40 hours of gameplay at that point in time. I was finally finishing the main missions. And it was on the very last mission. You have to do this thing where you're, like, you're walking out of a stronghold. And as you're doing this, like, some giant robot thing activates. That's supposed to take over your final location. You go into the final location and you do whatever the fuck it is you do to end the game. Every single time I walked out of the place, the game would freeze. The game would crash at the exact same point that would require the activation, that would activate the cutscene necessary to activate the robot and proceed with the mission. It would crash every single time I hit that little, whatever the invisible point is that was the activation of that scene. And so I tried to like fast travel out and come back from the other direction. It would never activate anything. And so, basically, because, like, that wouldn't, that never fixed itself. I, there was nothing I could do. I went and I tried to do, like, an hour's worth of other stuff elsewhere, then come back and do it. Nothing fixed it. Every single time, it crashed consistently at that spot. And so I could not finish the game because that one mission just kept crashing. I was like, all right, well, guess I'm done with Fallout 3. So that was kind of my last. Ever since then, I haven't really been able to get into Bethesda games as deeply uh, as I previously did beforehand. So, like, Fallout 4, it's fun, but it's just, it's not that kind of thing where there's so many people where it's just grabbing it, and they're playing for, like, tens or hundreds of hours since its release, and I am like, eh, you know, I got about five hours, I'm good. (laughs) So, that stopped after that long-ass story. Bloodborne The Old Hunters came out. Now, Bloodborne is a game that I am very much deeply entranced by, and contrast to the Bethesda games. I love that game. I played through, uh, I would say I had about four different plates, like doing, you know, different builds, different weapons. So I had like the first one, which is just an absolutely terrible attempt at a quality build. If you don't know what a quality build is, it's trying to equally balance strength and skill. Um, it was a very bad, 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 bad build. It was not good at all. Uh, my second build was a, I think it was a, no, it wasn't a skill build. I think it was a, no, my, yeah, that's what it was. My second uh, was an attempt at a skill build, but again, a very, very poor one. Then my third one was a blood tinge build. My fourth one was a beast claws character. And so, you know, I have all these characters to use. And so I run through the DLC the first time with the beast claws character because he, all the rest of them are in New Game Plus territory or further by then, like my Chicago build. The first build, which was just terrible, was in New Game Plus, and there was no way in hell 
I was going to succeed with a bad character at that point. Like, I could fix it, but that would require effort. And who wants to put in effort? Uh, the Chicago build was in, like, New Game Plus 4 by then. Um, and I was kind of bored of that by now, so I tried the Beast Claws character. So anyway, I don't want to get into it all. I played a lot of the old Hunters. I made a new skill build as well and ran through the game as quickly as I could and then got to the DLC with a skill build so I could use the Rakuyo. Uh, and so, you know, that consumed my time. Then I got Yokai Watch from uh, Gamefly, which is not going to last for me very long. I don't like... For some reason, like, level 5 makes some phenomenal games. They look great. They have really good atmosphere. They have a really solid kind of just overall composition. But they're so reliant on RNG that it bugs me. Like with Nino Kuni, for instance. I can't remember if there was anything you could do to impact the RNG that was uh, behind the monster recruitment of that game. I remember, the only thing I truly remember is that the only one that could potentially be recruited was the last recruitable monster you defeated in battle. So that's kind of how you, uh, I don't want to say you change it to your advantage because it's not really, anyway, that's the only thing I can remember, but it's still very heavily RNG based and some of the recruitment values were so low that it was entirely possible that, you know, if you didn't get good if you didn't have good luck right from the outset, you could be doing it for... You could be trying to recruit this one dude for hours. And it's a very similar thing with Yokai Watch. There are things you can do to impact it. There are different foods that you can give to Yokai in order to make them uh, want to join you more. But when it comes down to it, it's still all RNG. And I really just... Oh, that le I, RNG just bugs me because it just it's an unnecessary level of grinding that kind of... I don't know, I just, I don't like it. And so because of that, I couldn't really get into Yokai Watch in general. There are a couple other reasons, but again, this isn't about Yokai Watch. This was supposed to be a discussion about Guilty Gear, but then I got into the Fallout thing. And I don't want to get as deeply into the other games and stuffs that occurred. So, let us move forward. Anyway, that's what is preventing me from, like, you know, kind of, I haven't really recorded anything because of that. Um, and so... I do, I do want to get back into Guilty Gear. I would like to, and obviously Revelator is coming out at some point in time. Monsieur Daisuke has stated that he would like for the releases of the console versions to be closer to each other. I don't know if that's worldwide, or if it's just America and Japan. Because right now I know America and Japan have like a spring 2016 release date right now for Revelator. I don't know if anywhere else does it, but it would be not. It would be really nice if it was worldwide. That would set an absolutely amazing precedent for Arc System Works that hopefully the rest of their games would follow, and that would be just an absolutely fantastic step for them as a company. Um, but I don't know. We'll see. You know, obviously Central Fiction will have a console version. It'll probably be announced within like I'd say three or four months, something like that. Not in time for Evo, because why would they want their game to get the most attention it could possibly gain on the grandest stage of them all, right? What kind of poor business decision would that be? Shit. Anyway, I'm a little salty about that. But that being said, so like I said, with Guilty Gear I am, I would like to uh, get back into it. But the reason why like, I just didn't get into it to begin with was because there really aren't any characters in the game besides Chip that make me want to play them. Like, I'm kind of, right now, you know, there's four new characters. I, I don't know anything about Dizzy. I don't know how she plays because I've never seen her played. I, don't, I haven't really, like, searched out a lot of different pre-XR uh, Guilty Gear footage. And so, like, my, the most the majority of my exposure comes from NorCal events. But I don't think anybody played Dizzy in NorCal that I'm aware of. Um, so, yeah, I don't know anything about Dizzy. But I'm not interested in Johnny. I'm not interested in Jam. Um, I might kind of be interested in Jacko. That's kind of a wary... Like, I think she might be interesting, but all in all, probably not. But, she, like, I'm gonna try her out and see if that works. But aside from Jacko, like, Chip's the only other character in the game that I feel like I can play and have fun with. I have tried every other character in the game, and I just, none of them clicked with me. None of them made me really want to play them. I didn't have fun with them. Um, so that's basically the overarching reason why I didn't play Guilty Gear, was because I just couldn't find that character uh, that really made me want to play the game. So, hope now that we've... Realize I'm just a big doofus. Hopefully that'll be fixed and I will start getting some Guilty Gear stuff going on soon and I will be prepared for the droppage of Revelator. But so let's move on to Blaze Blue, Central Fiction. Can we talk about crying? Oh, I meant to mention this. 
it's raining outside right now, and that means every single time it rains, that means I have to do a Nate talk so I can mention that it's raining in California, man. It's such a rare event. But the thing is, this rainfall has nothing on the amount of salty liquid being shed over Blaze Blue Central Fiction. You watching any video period that has anything to do with Azrael and people are going to be bitching about his DP. There are people all over the world crying that that new Exceed Excel or whatever the hell it is, that new, that thing they blatantly ripped off from O'Neal, <laughs> uh, is overpowered and unfair and they need to nerf that. There are tears about nine being overpowered, which they managed to figure out from a 30 second gameplay video, apparently. That's a thing. You can definitely nail down how good or bad a character is in 30 seconds of a showcasing of their moves. Yep. Definitely logical. Then we have tears over the sound effects, which granted, I kind of agree with that. And I'm going to be adding my, some of my own tears into it soon. But still, the point being, why are people crying so much about things that like are irrelevant in the grand scheme of things? Now, let's mention Asriel first. Actually, let's not mention Asriel first. Let's mention um, Exceed Excel and Overdrive and the whole thing. So everybody in the world, like there were so many people that were just like, oh, it's safe on block. It, after Hema's uh, article came out, basically as like an overview of the system, how it worked, how he believed it would function, etc., etc. And everybody's like, oh my god, it's safe on block, that's bullshit. It doesn't have any super flash startup, that's bullshit. It gives active flow, that's bullshit. Like, all these things, right? Like, basically, the same exact thing with ha that happened with Guard Cancel Overdrive. Where suddenly it's the end of the world, and Blaze Blue as we know it, and this is the most overpowered function in the history of the world, and it's going to ruin the game, and what has it done? Been almost completely and utterly irrelevant. <laughs> like... Oh, man, I would say I have seen a success rate of 5% or so for uh, people hitting overdrive and then trying to exceed Excel the person. Like I said, I would say I've seen that actually work maybe 5% of the time. I've seen, and then the re out of the rest of that, 50% of the time it gets blocked, 50% of the time it gets it whiffs and gets punished. And so it's just like, how did you think this was going to play out? Like, Overdrive has such a ridiculous amount of startup to it that you have all the time in the world to be like, oh, okay, this person's probably going to be looking for uh, an Exceed Excel right now. So let me be just a little bit safer. Let me not be quite so reckless. The same exact way you would play against, like, a Ragna player that has 50 meter. They can just Inferno Divider you whenever the hell you want. Inferno Divider is a better move than most Exceed Excels are. The only difference is that uh, he requires meter to make it safe. But over but exceed Excel requires you to sacrifice your overdrive to make it safe. So like, it's so resource intensive. It's such a silly thing to believe it's gonna like truly affect the balance of the game. It's not. It's a very strong move. Don't get me wrong. It's very good. It's a great threat. But overdrive doesn't last long enough for it to be this like ruinous moment of any match. The moment overdrive gets activated, everything's just finished. Like it's not. It's no X factor. That's for damn certain. Um. So just seeing all of that was just like, man, people are blowing it so incredibly out of proportion. What's going on? And then Asriel, uh, there was it started with a match of a Asriel player named Ikaman against Nose, who is a fairly decent Hazma player. I've never really put him up at like the top level. Same thing with Ikaman, really. I've never put either of they're like they're very, they're both very good players, but neither of them are like that top level threat where you would place people like Dogura or Yoshiki or uh, Tetsuo, Sujikawa, you know, like that kind, of, that kind of level, the highest level of competition. I've never really placed on there. Mitsurugi, how did I, how did I forget about, like, probably one of the best players around right now? Um, actually, I, I haven't seen him in Central Fiction so far, I don't think. Anyway. It was, it was that video, and Ikumin was running the train on it, on nose. Like, it was not, <laughs> it did not look good. It, but you could very clearly tell, like, anybody, well, not anybody, clearly not anybody, judging by the comments on that video, but most people could very easily tell that he was just not very comfortable with the Hazuma changes. He had a lot of getting used to, whereas Ikumin was just, like, 
fuck, it's Azrael. Let me go nuts. And that's what he did. He went nuts. And he was landing the DP on him, like, oh, man, too often. Too often. Now, let me be blunt. That DP is, like, perfectly tailored to fight characters like Taukaka or maybe Valkenheim. Valkenheim might be a little bit too fast for it. Or Hazuma, who were always kind of attacking at a diagonal angle from the air, which was always a particular weakness of Azrael's before. He never really had anything to deal with kind of airborne attacks like that or airborne maneuverability like that. And now that DP is actually pretty damn strong at preventing people from just flying around his head recklessly. Um, but, the, you know, it's just everybody's like, oh my god, it's the most overpowered move in the world. It's so good. Look at how often he's landing it, blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, it's the same exact thing where clearly this guy is not very good with current Hosma yet. He has so much to do. He has so much learning to do. And then you're like you're over you're overemphasizing the actual like quality of the move. You can see incredibly clearly that it does not have much of a horizontal hitbox to it. It's if you stay grounded, you could probably like anybody in the cast would probably be capable of low profiling it and then getting a massive punish on the other end of it. It's more punishable uh, than Inferno Divider, I would say. Um, anyway, point B, like, I, I don't want to get too deeply into it, but it's just like, it's the same exact kind of thing where it's so obvious that it's not that Ikumin and is particularly good or that the DP is particularly good. It's that Nose just doesn't really know how to deal with that yet. And he's already struggling with Hazuma to begin with. So you combine those factors and it just makes everything else look so much worse. But it's very obvious. And yet everybody's like, fuck, Asriel's so overpowered. Look at Hazma, he's low tier for sure. And it's like, this is somebody that understands how to play their character against somebody that doesn't yet. Are you kidding? Like, fucking, just give it a second. Just a moment of logical thought, please, before you start declaring the end of the world. Damn, but now it's time for me to declare the end of the world. Tager. Now you may be thinking, I always going to mention Atomic Collider. Tama Collider sucks now. Oh, he's going to mention Gadget Finger. Why the hell would they nerf Gadget Finger? It was already bad enough to begin with. Maybe he'll be mentioning uh, the differences to his command grabs now. He no longer has a 360B that does 3,500 damage, plus potentially another 100 if you add Gadget Finger on the end of it. Maybe it's... I think they, they nerfed 720 a bit further too, right? Like, I think 720 does less damage. I don't know. Who gives a shit? No, not going to mention any of that. All that's irrelevant. Don't care about his gameplay in any way, shape, or form. You know what's the matter? <laughs> You know what's the end of the world for Tager? That motherfucker has one of the most absurd, mind-bogglingly bad sound effects I have ever heard in my life when he gets hit. I think it's usually when he gets hit from uh, Airborne. The only way I can describe it, like I, I should have listened to it prior to uh, recording this because then I would have been able to try and imitate it to the best of my ability, but it's been a while since I've heard it now, so I, I, don't, I don't really trust myself to do it accurately. But the only way I can try to appropriately describe it is the dying sound of a goat. Like, that that's it. I have no idea what the hell, where it came from. It is one of the most absurd, stupid-sounding things I have ever heard in my life. And it blows my mind that this had to start with a voice actor making that noise and going, Fuck yeah. Nailed it! Somebody in the sound booth who heard it recorded, recorded it, and then shipped it off for further processing and went, fuck yeah. He nailed it. And then somebody that has to do with inputting sound into the game put it in and was like, oh, damn, that voice actor nailed it. And then Mori at that point in time, who is just tortured completely and utterly from the overall lack of quality in the current sound effects of the game, it does not, it does not sound good. Like, I, I know so many people have talked about how bad the sound effects are, but the voices are bad. There's a lot of echoing, like where they sound like they recorded it in a very poor quality sound booth. There's a lot of echoing. It's very, um, I don't really know how to properly describe it. I don't have the term on the tip of my tongue for it, but it's basically just like, it just doesn't sound right. It sounds off. It sounds like something was wrong while recording it, that there was just some kind of echoing to it. There's some kind of echoing factor. That just makes it sound a little bit off. Everything, voice acting, sound effects, uh, anything. It all just sounds off. And so Mori's been tortured by all of this shit. And he doesn't even hear it. He's not even there. He's checked out mentally so he doesn't have to suffer anymore. So he just lets it slide through. 
Damn, it sounds terrible. And that is the end of the world with Tega. It's the end of the line. I can put up with constant stupid design decisions associated with his character. I can put up with his constant fluctuation in terms of uh, balance capability. I can put up with how easily counterpickable the character is. But you ruin his sound effects? I'm done. I, that's where, that is where I put my foot down and no longer, I will not step over that line. You ruined him. Ruined him. Also, they took away my colors, I think. I'm trying to think. What color did they take? No, they took away Bullet. That's the thing. They ruined Bullet for me because they took away color number two. Redhead Bullet. She's not in the game no more. <sighs> ah. They did take away my cut, my Taker color from CS, though. That was my uh, kind of like, purp this is my purplish color. It took that away. It's never come back. It's never coming back. I'm never getting my color back. Nobody loves me. And you know what scares me? I haven't seen Pink Azrael yet. If they took away all my colors, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to cry. I'm going to just curl up in the fetal position and cry for weeks and weeks and weeks. <sighs> but anyway, let's talk about the new characters. Naoto. At first, I was interested in him. For one very specific reason. He had the ability to charge attacks up and then cancel them. I don't know what it is about that function. For instance, Shin Wu in King of Fighters 13 has that function. Loved him for it. There's something about the ability to just charge your moves and threaten with them. But then cancel them. And do other things. Just that additional layer of kind of mind game behind it that really appeals to me. And I really love it. So initially, that's what that is what drew me to Naoto in the first place. But then, like seeing him in motion now, it's just kind of eh. Doesn't look like a terribly fun character. I'm just kind of like eh, whatever. <laughs> maybe I'll try him. Maybe not. Probably not because everybody and their mother is super hype over him. And now I'm like that kind of, that alone, like the fact that you think just about everybody's gonna be playing him, that will kind of kill it for me. But the surprise is Habiki. The very first time I saw him was the exact opposite. I looked at him, I saw him, and I was like, yeah, whatever, doesn't even look interesting, doesn't look nice at all. Now I'm actually seeing him in motion, and I'm like, oh, damn. He actually looks really cool, he looks fun to play, he looks pretty solid. Let me try this character. He has an Azuna drop. <laughs> How can you not play a character that has an Azuna drop? Shit, that's basically a requirement. Fucking amazing move. So now I'm interested in Habiki. And uh, that has... So, like, I mean, Asriel, no doubt. Like, I love playing Asriel. But it can kind of grow dull to do, like, non-stop. You definitely... Asriel, for me at least, is the kind of character that you need to have a sub or two to uh, play and just kind of... Because otherwise it gets kind of boring. At least in my opinion. Because it's kind of like... I don't know. Anyway, I don't really have solid reasoning behind it. That's just how it is. I just kind of get bored with playing him too much. Makoto's in there. Talkaka's in there. I'm actually not really liking the look of Talkaka. Like she kind of looks less ridiculous. I don't know that. Like that doesn't really make sense because it kind of sounds like I'm speaking about her like overall ability as a character, like her strength as a character. Ah, uh, she's not S plus to you no more. I don't care about her. Not that, but how it just kind of seems like she's less uh, capable of doing wild things, of just going bonkers. And I'll freely admit, that's the kind of character I get attracted to. Like, I know there's a ton of people that are so incredibly judgmental against people that just play to go nuts. I like playing that way. Pure and simple. I get, I derive enjoyment from it. I just like to go nuts and see what I can do. And so, you know, Taokaka kind of looks like that aspect of her has been toned down quite a bit. And so I don't know how uh, appealing she is to play anymore. But we'll see. We've added Hibiki to the list. Makoto's always been on the list. I've just been too damn lazy to learn uh, all the timing of her you know, her drive moves. But apparently they've made it easier to handle level 3 stuff in this uh, in CF. So we'll see. Maybe this will be the time. Who knows? Um, but yeah, I mean, there's always a selection of characters floating around in the back of my mind that I'm just kind of like, yeah, you know, if I got the time, sure, I'll learn them. I'll try them out. Why the fuck not? So we'll see how that happens. But let's talk about the other new character. Nine. Now, I kind of already mentioned, like... I mean, I'm not interested in this character at all. I'll be perfectly upfront. Don't really care for magic-type characters to begin with. You will never see me start out a game and pick the mage. Like, if there's a class-based system, I will never pick the mage the first time around. There's just something about magic using characters that just does not appeal to me in some fashion. 
So I am personally not interested in her, but that being said, she looks very flashy. She looks, I don't know, I don't want to necessarily say convoluted, because I don't know how complicated the, her whole spell system is right now, but it looks like she's going to have a lot of options because of her spell system. That's always good. Having options is an excellent thing. Uh, so, but, I mean, that being said, you know, like, there's a limited amount of stuff available. She got boobies. <laughs> Shout out to those of you that like those, because she definitely got those. She got some legs. She's showing them off. So, you know, eye candy, for those of you that care for that sort of thing. That's about the extent of my knowledge of nine at the moment. What else do I got? Do I got anything else? I want to talk about who I believe is going to be a threat that is currently flying under the radar a little bit but that is going to make a splash at some point in time and people are not going to expect it but i'm calling it here and now now you have characters like for instance asriel valkenhain izayoi these are the predictable ones these are the ones that you're just like these characters are going to be monsters they're going to blow some people up arakune is the character that I think is going to surprise people in this game. He looks very strong. He looks very, very strong, very scary. Not CT level, like, oh shit, he's going to ruin the game. But very, very strong. And he, because he was so just, eh, overall, throughout the entirety of Chrono Phantasma, people just kind of forgot about him. Like, they've just kind of forgotten he's existed. They're going to be, they're going to be reminded. They're going to learn today. Real damn soon, some Arakunes are going to rise up and blow some people up. And they're going to be like, oh, fuck, I forgot this character was in the game. I wish he wasn't. Oh, damn, he's back. I'm calling it right now. I'm saying it. Now somebody got to pick up Arakune and blow some people up and make me right. So please do that. I would appreciate it. <laughs> um, that's about it. That's all I had to say. I've talked for long enough. Thank you for listening. Sorry I went off on that long-ass tangent about Fallout. Hope you enjoyed it. That is it. It is starting to rain harder. So I need to go and do my daily uh, reminiscing of singing in the rain. Peace.